Hello, everyone. This is Fahim Niaz from Graphicsly. We wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us today for uh, the Clip Studio Paint Digital Inking webinar uh, presented by Brian Haberlin. Hello. Hello, Brian. So just before we start the webinar, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like everyone to be aware of. First of all, the webinar will be approximately an hour long. We may go over slightly by a few minutes. All attendees will be muted. Um, the Q&A session is going to happen during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. So please make sure to ask your questions right away um, in the question box area. We will uh, make sure to address as many questions um, as possible and we will have a full house today. So uh, just letting you know that uh, we've reached our capacity already. Um, if you happen to be on social media, please let everyone know that the recording will be available afterwards. Um, not all questions will be answered. We'll try to get to them either on social media or in some other way. As I mentioned earlier, the webinar will be recorded um, and the recording will be shared on social media and sent via email to registrants and attendees. Um, and once again, panelists are myself, um, Fahim, Joanna from Celsius, and Brian, who is our presenter. All right. Just a little bit of information about Clip Studio Paint. Um, there may be some of you who um, are joining the webinar for the first time or have never heard of Clip Studio Paint. So Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. For more information, please check out our site at clipstudio.net forward slash en or at graphicsly.com. And with that, um, Brian will be going through the webinar. Um, his focus will be on digital inking techniques. And the webinar has been brought to you by Graphicsly, Celsius, the developers of Clip Studio, and obviously Wacom. And there's a nice picture of Brian using his Wacom right there. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Brian to share his screen. And uh, and he'll go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. All right, guys. Hi, I'm Brian Haberlin. I've been doing comics since 1993. Been a professional illustrator since I was about 18. Uh, I have up in front of you some of the the work that I I do. Um, I'm uh, I run Anomaly Productions, um, and we do books like uh, Anomaly, Faster and Light. This is a image from a new book called Sonata black and white. This was from Medieval Spawn, Medieval Witchblade, which just came out, just finished a miniseries. It was a lot of fun. I, I co-created Witchblade and it was it was fun to play with my character again. And I hadn't played with her in a very long time. So that was fun. And these are some of the images from that. This is an image from a charity book we did for the Las Vegas shooting victims called Where We Live. If you guys want to support it, you can Google Where We Live. It raises money for the victims of the shooting. Again, I show this stuff more just to say, okay, he's he kind of knows a little bit about what he's doing. So, you know, that's why I show this stuff. There's a promo picture for a new book we're doing called The Marked, A Coven of Rune Wielding Witches. Faster and light cover, faster and light, faster and light. Pressure and light. Boom, boom, boom. And just so you can kind of see what, what, what I do for a living. And just real quick, uh, you can find me at these places. And I can't, I'm much more posting little, little tutorials these days, so it's definitely worth checking out. So, all right, let's get to some teaching. Um, this program, Clip Paint Studio is the program you want to use in doing comics and the, the program you really want to use in doing inking and stuff like that. Uh, the reason is, as I explained people to it, because I, if you ink in Photoshop, and I'm sure a lot of people do, um, it really is a bit of a round, round peg in a square hole. You have to really know what you're doing. You have to make a real proper brush. And even then, it's not going to do all the things you want to do. This program does what programs should do, which makes things easier that you're working on, not harder, 
Okay. Um, so let me let, let's get into it first because I promised a couple of people on on how we do some uh, flatting and things in this program, and then we'll go to inking. We're going to touch on a whole bunch of stuff. I'm sure I'm going to run out of time, um, but uh, we can always do another one of these later on, and there'll probably be some new tutorials on digital art tutorials as well. So. Having said that, okay, so right now I have in front of me a beautiful John Buscema cover. Uh, also a good tip for you guys, if you're looking for things to work over or practice on or whatever, uh, Heritage Auctions, which is ha.com, they post high-res images of all the things that they auction. And we're talking about millions of pieces of art from all over the place. Uh, pencils, which I'll show you because we're, we're actually going to have fun uh, inking a, uh, a John Buscema pencil here. I'm not doing my own stuff because it's funner to do somebody else's stuff if I'm going to demo some stuff. Uh, I get sick of my own work. So, uh, so we have a cover here right now. Um, let me go ahead and really quick, I want to show you some real basic stuff in, in here for uh, flatting colors, which people don't know this program can do. Uh, first, let's go ahead and I'm going to get another one of these covers up real quick just to show you uh, a lot of people don't know that this program can do these things so let's go ahead and desktop there we go Promo. and grab a black and white you know, there we go so this is a witchblade cover you notice it's a flattened image there's no it's white it's black and white okay uh, Clip paint has a wonderful convert brightness to opacity. So now what that will do is basically what you can do in Photoshop by having this in an alpha channel, you have to go through steps, right? Half the things in Clipping Studio, they're not steps, they're just boom and it's done, okay? And that's, that's one of the great things about this. So now we have everything that was white was transparent. We're gonna make another layer underneath so you can see the little gray in there. So now all that stuff is automatically one step go, boom, transparent, okay? Now, you can always do this stuff in multiply mode or not, but where this comes in handy is when you're going to start laying in some quick flats, okay? And I'm really going to do a torture chest here because everyone who has, who has ever shown the, the flatting abilities of, uh, of this program, and don't worry, we're going to get into inking too, but this all applies to that as well. Um, there we go. So I have this code and cover that I already did the, the conversion. So I already did convert brightness to opacity. Okay. Now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and make a layer underneath it with some color. Okay. And then the trick is on the LiDAR layer that I have, see the little lighthouse up here? This is set as reference layer. By doing this, you can really, you have the fill tools will reference this line art, even though you're on another layer, okay, which is pretty darn cool. Um, and then what we're going to do is go to a bucket tool and you'll notice in your sub tool menu, there's close and fill. Okay. And what that will do is that will recognize areas. Now there's a lot of settings to it. Um, but let me show you kind of basically how it, how it works. So it will recognize even with gaps like this. I mean, this is not, you know, there's holes, gaps, the whole nine yards. Okay. And everyone who's ever demoed this stuff. I see online is always like it's totally nice closed simple shapes it's like eh, do it with some hard stuff so we're doing it with some hard stuff so i'm going to move this over to kind of a a darker cool i'm going to grab this whole area down here so i have the bucket tool all set up it's like a little lasso so i'm not notice i'm not really grabbing you know carefully on anything here and boom it selected that stuff. Now you notice it's never always like absolutely perfect. So that's always when I would jump to, over to a pen tool for a, for a quick uh, cleanup. You know, just kind of pop over here, see that little bit that I missed right there. Done. Okay. I go back in here. Let's say I, again to show you kind of the complexity of this. Move the flat color around. Let's go ahead and get this sword. So notice I'm just loosely going around the sword. I'm not being careful. Boom, I got the sword. This will save you so much time. <clears throat> it's not even funny. So boom, boom. I'm gonna go around, grab the shirt. 
Boom. Now you notice again a little overspray over here, but hey, that's pretty pretty darn good. Okay. Notice again this like cool little smoke that uh, that Conan has kind of coming around him like this that John used to do. I'm gonna just gonna grab here, go go from here to here to here, back over here. Pretty nice, huh? I mean, we got a little gap in there, but it even stopped here, and there's a huge hole here. You know, it didn't seep out anywhere else like that. So this is a great tool for doing this kind of stuff. Um, the other combo in doing this sort of flatting uh, work is to use it in conjunction, like I showed you already, with the pen tool. So you just hit P, go to the pen, fix any gaps you want. So like, again, I'm hitting P. I guess I have a simple G pen selected right now. Uh, this is a stock pen. Almost everything that I'm showing you, other than the ones I'll show you that I customize, uh, are, are basically with the package. Okay, But boom, all set. The other tool that's handy with this sort of thing is you can take any of these tools and make them reference a, ref, a, a layer like that. So if you notice on G-Pen right now, if you look down on the tool property list, it's pretty basic, right? But there's always these other tool properties that are in here in a subfolder. And I'm just showing you this screen to show you. Oh, there's the overflow right here. So I can hit, start hitting these things and give myself some more controls in that layer down there. Okay. So what I did was you'll see a G pen, copied a G pen, and I made it a fill. So you can see now it has those same features, the gap stabilization and stuff like that that I had before in the uh, bucket fill. So now I have a pen that will recognize where the lines are as well. So if I go over here and where's a good, good example, let's see, I'll do the sword. So one stroke, yeah, I went a little out there. Let's try one stroke again. Boom, one stroke. Okay. And then just to show you how that could work too, if I had a bigger brush, if I go right in the middle, it will just go through that middle. Now it's smooth a little bit there, but again, this is hard line art for it to do this trick with. Okay? Um, really quickly, since I know again, we're gonna be running out of time. Uh, the things you wanna set when you're doing this stuff is you'll notice right now, there's all these different settings you can have. Right now I have, area surrounded by black. So that's what it's selecting, okay? So if you go ahead and start trying to do this stuff and you're going, oh, it's not working like Brian showed me, it worked. Chances are you have it set to something else. And in some cases, you're gonna want it set to something else. But for general line art, area surrounded by black. Now, this setting will describe how, how well the program will recognize gaps in the line art. Right now I have it set up to full. Color margin specifies the color by, color changes. Uh, area scaling will specify whether to scale up and down the area created with the width of it. Um, but the main ones, if you start having problems and things don't quite work the way you want to, these are the ones that you mess with to dial in for your particular line art. <clears throat> and chances are, if you're working on your own line art, you're really gonna just need to dial these in once because it's gonna be the way you do line art. If you're working with somebody new all the time, then you're probably gonna have to do a little fiddling, um, but not a lot, okay? All right, so I wanted to show that. I think that's pretty darn nifty. Um, the other tool that's very handy when you come to doing these colors things and, and it gets a little tricky is um, if I go over here, there is a lasso fill tool. And this is again, another example of, of where Clip Studio I think does th something very, very simply, uh, where if I had to do the same thing in Photoshop, it'd be this and a keyboard command. This, the bucket, or not the bucket, but it's a lasso tool, I can just boom and start. Wherever I draw, I'm just filling with color. Okay. So you see how quickly, too, you can lay in flats that way. I'm going to show you how to use this as an inking tool as well. But here's the here's the big trick for this, because people, I'll show this, this tool to people, and they'll go, uh, I can't find it where it is. So it's in a sub tool uh, 
palette here where there's the ruler and it's under direct draw and that fools a lot of people okay? they expect it to be under the lasso tool or the bucket tool but it's under the, the the direct draw line okay so it's right down here lasso fell okay all right so let's get into some inking stuff all right so this is a Conan that I started playing with. This is a John Buscema Conan. There's the sketch. So basically, I'm just going to make a new layer and start inking on top of it. And then we're going to jump into a whole bunch of other fun stuff that this stuff will do. Okay. So things to note when you're bringing in something for inking. Notice the resolution I have up here on top, on the top bar. So I have 4,000 by basically 6,000 pixels. When you're inking something, and if you're not inking in a vector program, if you're inking in a raster program, um, and this does vector as well, but I, I, I work with, with, with raster more now because we can do such high resolution that it practically is like manipulating vector these days and i have so many options and so many programs to manipulate it as well um so but what you want to make sure is you don't want to be inking this if it was a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels because you're just going to get jaggies and bitmaps and all that kind of stuff um but let's say you did want to still ink this piece there is nothing wrong with taking this piece and resizing it to the size you need to ink it on uh, because then the final art is going to be the ink, and you're going to be cleaning it up as you go. I mean, you can see this is still, there's a lot of roughness to this pencil and stuff. And you'll see as we go along and start cleaning things up, what happens to that. Um, so let's go ahead and make a new layer. I have a, a cell, this is an adapted old brush, but if we're just going to use the simple, we can just use the simple G pen as a great pen, okay? Uh, let's talk about this, the, uh, the, a couple of settings here on the pen. Let's go ahead and get to black. Um, so as I draw, I can get a really nice, thick, thin tip, very smooth, that sort of thing. Uh, stabilization is what smooths your work more or less. Okay. Um, as you get more and more stabilization, it gets more, it gets more smoother. There you go. Uh, and, but it's kind of pretty smooth, even at the lower, lower levels. This used to affect performance more than it does now, but what you want to kind of find is your nice, I think like a happy medium is usually pretty good here. Okay. Yeah, there they all go. So layer, right now I have the layer in, in just normal mode. Uh, I'll, we'll go through the changes on that too. Uh, so, and usually about 20 pixels. If you're doing a full, a normal comic book size page for an American comic, this is usually on 11 by 17 Bristol board, you know, or the equivalent digitally, uh, 400 DPI to 600 or 800 DPI, okay? Um, at 400 DPI, I usually find a 20 pixel brush is my go-to size, you know, because this way I can go light, I can go heavy and thicker if I want to. So I'm just kind of going in, you know, taking the eye, going through, chung, chung, chung. Start breaking stuff down. Little strokes. You'll find as you're inking, you know, these little double line things are nice. So you have little opening and gaps and things. No. And this is really nice to work over John's stuff. And you can get like, you know, nice kind of loose stuff. It, it, this brush sort of feels like a mix between a quill and, um, and a brush like a sable brush. You see how to start doing dits. Now, I'm using the, the G pen right now for 
the detail parts, right? And again, you can always go smaller with this brush if you want. The problem is with digital work, it's so easy to like, you know, all of a sudden you're starting to do, you know, you're in here like this close starting to ink and you're doing lines that are really, really super thin that aren't going to apply. Try not to get too close in on, on the stuff you're working on because otherwise you will get lost in the detail and you'll waste time because you have to remember, again, if we're looking at a screen size and we're looking at this thing printing on a, on a comic book size image, which is basically, uh, you know, 10 inches tall, we're talking about that. So don't waste time on, on, on detail that you're really not going to see. Okay. All right. Um, let's go through how I would kind of start this. I kind of jumped in with the G pen, but really one of the great ways to just kind of get the structure going quickly on this stuff is to, uh, lay in, uh, some, some, some blacks. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and use that lasso fill tool. Okay. So now this will, you'll get this pretty fast. Um, this will enable me to jump in and start blocking in big shapes very quickly. Now I'm not being super careful here, but what's nice about it is, so if I had to do that shape drawing it, it would take me a little bit to draw that, you know? This way I can really kind of get some really interesting thick, thin shapes. You can even kind of use it like, I'm just doing a little loop shape and see how I'm getting this kind of nice like brush stroke kind of shape there. Again, messing with his hair, pulling some more blacks in here. I'm planning on working back into these blacks. So, you know, again, I just want to get the general shape, but you can even do some nice contour lines. See that nice thick thin you can get with it. So I'm just, again, using lasso fill here. And just again, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's spotting blacks. But as I said too, this is also a great tool for, for, for flatting some things as well. But if I start, you know, laying in stuff on this guy back here, getting some nice shapes, laying some blacks on the, on the monkey. And the idea here is just, you know, it, it's kind of kind of a, a speed thing, you know, but again, see how that kind of, I can get that really kind of interesting shape still with a little bit of that hair just by going around with the lasso tool, just boom, 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 boom. Okay, I'm going to go back to the pen tool. Now, the other thing that is great about this program is, you know, if you're in Photoshop and you have to go back with your tools to erase, erase, right? Unless you have the eraser set to the exact brush you're using, you're not going to be, you're going to be erasing with essentially a different tool and a different look. Here, they have a wonderful transparency. So I can just basically go back essentially with my G pen and start doing some negatives or transparencies with that same brush without switching going in and changing the eraser tool to this, that, and the other thing. This is really a nice option because it's very quick. I can jump over here, go back and forth and get rid of that stuff. Again, the other good thing too about having, the best thing about having digital inks is being able to have these great whites that you can pull. So I can go in, you know, throw a little fly, couple flyaways, which get really nice. I use the X button to switch to black and white. So I don't know if anyone does real, real inking, but getting a really nice white in the real world is not the easiest thing in the world. So I'm just throwing lines. Um, what you'll find, I don't know how many people in the audience are, are seasoned inkers or not seasoned inkers. What you'll find is you're going to be naturally a puller, meaning start and go that way, or a thrower, 
So I'm starting and I'm throwing it away from myself now. Okay. Just find which works for you. If you're more natural, whatever, I find that if you start inking a whole bunch of stuff, like if I'm inking every day, which I don't ink every day, um, if I'm inking every day, I can throw or pull or do whatever I want to do. Um, but my my general default setting is pulling. Okay. And the techniques that you want to do too when you're doing this stuff. Um, so you want to, you know, I have my hand on my, I have a Cintiq that I'm working on right now. Uh, I have my hand on it for most small inking, resting on the palm of my hand will give me a lot of control. If you need to throw longer lines, what you'll find is you're often better off just using your whole arm as an arc. That's what will enable you to throw a nice, long, even line. So think about it like sort of, <clears throat> think about it as, as, as an arc, so wherever your pivot point is, if your pivot point is a longer pivot point, then you can pull a longer line. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get some more of this inking guy done. So I'm just going through. Again, it's really nice having really beautiful line art to to mess with. Just throwing right now. Get some hair, go back in here. Go back down here, give him some of his neck muscles. John's got some interesting expressive lines here, so I'm just going to kind of go with those. Monkey, 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 monkey. Give the monkey some hair. Again, so the, 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 the brush right now has thick and thin on. So down here is where you have the subtool palette that has all the different other controls that you can change to. So you have brush tip shape, you have <clears throat> anti-aliasing, you have texture you can throw on here, all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's where you have all your real control controls. Right now, this has a nice thick and thin on it. Just going back and forth here. Has nice thick and thin opacity, good tip. Has a little bit of the stabilization going on it, which is great help. I'm gonna finish his eye a little bit more. Just kind of hopping around a little bit here. I was going to get a little bit farther on this, and I'm going to show you guys some brush creation stuff. But anyway, so this is this is basically me, for the most part, other than that lasso tool, using the tools in clip paint like you would essentially as a traditional inker. Okay. Um, so let's go in through a couple other things. So now we have these nice tones here as well. So let's say we wanted to add some half tones here. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and make another layer. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and go with the lasso tool. I'm just going to kind of grab some areas that I want to have some half tone in. I'm holding the shift key, so I'm selecting several places at once. Get his here, here. Give him a little bit of his neck there. And then what you do is you take the half tone, drag it over. And you have the halftone image. Now, what I like about this is, especially if you're working digitally, uh, halftones can be a little tricky. I mean, because if you look at this halftone right now, it's way too fine for probably what we want to do. You know, I, I usually prefer a, if I'm going to do halftone, I'm going to do a halftone to show you got a halftone there. Okay. But what's great is you can go down here and just go ahead and, okay, so the line frequency is too high. Let's go with a 10 probably. Hit OK. So now I have this here. So I'm going to just undo the half tone I threw in there. I still have my selection and then drag the new one over. And you can eyeball it and go, oh yeah, that's what I want. You know, you also have the ability to change the angle of it. You have the ability to change the type. And you have the ability to change the density. Density will make it darker. So if I go, you know, let's say uh, 35. 
you'll see now it gets a little denser than it was before to show you that a little bit more in a dramatic change. You see again, see how the dots are getting closer together. So if I undo up now, drag this back over, there you go. Now the other thing too with the halftone layer, so let's say that's the halftone that we want. It's now in a layer with, with essentially a layer mask. So I can go back in with my pen. You see over here where we have the layer and we have the black here, that's our layer mask. I'm clicking on that. And then when I draw, I'm basically drawing with halftone. So if I want to add some halftone here or add some halftone over here or here or back over here. And then I can always go back with the transparent and it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want it all there. But what's kind of nice about that is rather than doing these kind of plain half tony shapes, and you can also do this with a soft brush if you want as well, a, a regular airbrush. Um, <clears throat> But what I like about this is the ability to sort of, you know, ink with halftone. So I can do, you know, I can start throwing in shapes and lines. Okay. And one last bit before we jump into other, other creation. You'll notice right now my inks are in normal mode. Okay. So that means if I come back over here and I start throwing white in areas, I'm going to obscure things underneath. A lot of times I like that because if you leave the the pencils there, you can kind of fool yourself into thinking at the end of the day, oh, I've inked that, you know, but you really haven't inked that. So white will help kind of with that. But if you have this in the other way to ink is in multiply mode, You'll see now white becomes transparent. So I can draw, I I can draw with white now, but the white's just going to affect the black line. Okay. All right. Let's jump into some cool brush creation. Conan. Okay. The other thing that is round peg round hole about this program is the brushes curve as you use them. So you can make brushes in this program that you cannot make in Photoshop at all, okay? Um, I drew here a little little sort of cloud shape setup, okay? What I'm gonna use it for is to make a sort of a cloud brush, sort of a cool comic cloud brush. So I'm taking this image, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the marquee tool, I'm selecting it, and this stuff will be on YouTube later on, so you know, if Going too fast for you. You guys can reference back to the to the uh, to the tutorials, and I'll be doing some new tutorials for this stuff on digital art tutorials as well. Um, so I have it selected. I'm going to go ahead and register material. This is how you make a brush. So this is this almost applies to anything at this point. Any shape you want that you want to make into a brush, image. Use brush for tip shape. That's an important thing for you guys to to mark right there. Okay. All materials. I usually throw everything into my illustration part, but you just need to pick something here. Um, but this is the important part. So there's a search tag. So you start getting a gazillion uh, brushes in there. You can put in cloud part. So that will help me find that when I go to change my brush tip shape. I'm going to hit OK. All right, I'm going to make another layer here get rid of our cloud. Now, these are the, uh, the pattern brushes. And the fastest way to make a pattern brush, see, this will give you an example of, of what they do. So this is, this is a stock one, Melody. It's, it's basically uh, music shapes. But see how that brush actually curves as I take it around. So that's what we want to have in our cloud brush. So the fastest way to, to make these brushes is if I take a brush like this that I want to use as a base, come down here, create a copy of it. I'm going to call it new cloud. Hit OK. And I have new cloud down here. You go down here is where you can set so it's a new brush tip shape. So I'm going to go to the brush tip shape. 
you'll see right here I have the old brush tip shade you click on that and I go down here and you'll see there's the different brushes that I've made if I go cloud you'll see there's a few cloud that I've made before grab that now I'm gonna close this now what I have is the ability to make cloud shapes and see I, I can curve them I can again change the brush size so we need smaller kind of explosions you know if I go so I'm going from left to right and if I go left to right in the cloud you'll see how the shape goes around and again if you go to a bigger brush the explosion gets bigger and bigger that's kind of cool if I go the other way just so you know notice how it works so if I'm going let's go make another layer if I'm going from left to right, you'll see it's kind of like the underside of the cloud. If I go from right to left, I get the top part. So let's say I wanted to have that part be the top part, and then I'd go this way if I want the explosion clouds under that size. See, now that would be the wrong way to go. I want to go this way. So I get the clouds going that way. This is wonderful, okay? Uh, and this can be full color. Uh, again, they have a bunch of stock things that come in so you can get the idea of how these things, these, these, these guys work uh, up here. Uh, they have uh, like, for example, so you can see how they work. This is a stock brush that's in there right now that I'm showing you. So this is uh, a chain brush that's in there. And that can be full color. It can be the colors you pick depending on how you create the brush, and we'll go in, go into that in a second. Um, but the other the other ones that I love is like, so some other clouds that I've made. This is like my Jeff Darrow clouds. So, you see the cloud shape? And see how, I mean, this is what I love about it, is that ability to curve these things. And then of course, you know, Get bigger with them. This can save you a lot of time. Okay. All right. So let's go to another trick. The other thing I like about this is that with the ability to take a brush that you capture that's going to curve with you, as opposed to Photoshop where it would just be chunk, 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 you know, it never will curve the brush. It will just be uh, squares of that brush turning. And you can fake it by making them thin and, and other stuff like that. But you can't actually take a natural brush that you make in the real world and copy it and put it on here. But here you can. So this is the brush stroke right here that we have. Couple tricks for when you guys are making this stuff. Um, if I right click on the menu, you'll see that I get, let's see, do, 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 where am I at? Do, 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 do. Convert layer. You want that to be on gray if you wanna be able to change the color of a brush as you're working with it via the palette. This is an important tip, okay? Because the first brushes I started doing were in color. And that's meant for like the one I just showed you where there was the gold, the gold chain brush that I was just doing. That was built with all those colors in it and stuff and was saved as a color. But if you want to create a brush that then you can make it white, black, gray, whatever, you need it to be in gray. This is a very important tip. Okay. This took me a little while to kind of figure out. I don't need to change it because I already have it in gray. Again, the process is fairly similar to what we just did. So I'm going to go ahead and get the marquee tool, select this brush. You can see over here is where I've already been using that brush a bit. So I'm selecting the area. I'm registering the material. Oh, God, I'm running out of time way too fast. Um, 
So here, again, this is the other really important thing right here, guys. Use tool brush tip shape. Image materials right here. Save it there, add a tag. I've already done that, so I'm not going to redo that. So now the brush that I made with this. You know, is right here. So again, what's great about it is you get these really beautiful, natural things that curve again. You can draw with these. I got gray going on. I'm in the gray. The reason why this is going gray is because I was drawing back in that gray layer. So grab any color you want. This is wonderful for making your own really unique brushes, okay? And then if I can do it really fast, I'm gonna show you one last really incredible thing that the program does, file new. This is, uh, I refer to it as, uh, these are file objects. So I'm gonna make a new image, hit okay. This is great for like concepting stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and just use a regular pen pen tool, I'm kind of thinking about a landscape, you know, a landscape like this, and rocks up here, rocks up there. I want to throw some some cool sort of an obelisk -y kind of thing that I want to work on in this. So I'm going to make another layer, and I'm going to make my obelisk -y shape that's just going to be beautiful and well done and perfect. And then I'm going to go ahead and make selection. Then what I'm going to do is file object. So I'm convert to a file object. I want my selection area, that's good. That's all good, hit okay. And it will ask you to save it. Save it, great, okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate this layer, duplicate the layer, duplicate the layer, okay. Go back over here to the move tool grab that one, you know, again, I can scale it, rotate it a bit, grab the other one, make it farther in the distance, it's gonna be back there, flip it, why not? Go back over there, grab this one, we'll have that more in the foreground. Okay. I don't need to see the original one anymore. So now what I'm going to do now, so you're going, oh, great. You just, you know, set up all these wonderful shapes. Well, we can refine these shapes and it will propagate through the file. Right clicking again, going down to file object. This time I want to open the file of the file object. So there it is. So now I'm going to refine it a bit more. In fact, I'm not even going to find it. You know what I decided I wanted? I want a tree in there instead. So I'm going to take this tree that I already have from this file. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go back over here to where we got our, our image. I'm going to paste it in there. It's a little big, so I'm going to scale it down. Put it in there. I'm going to make it a little thinner. Bring it down there. Hit Enter. And I'm going to actually get rid of this guy real quick. No. So we just have our nice little tree. I'm going to merge it down. And I'm going to save. Now, watch what happens when I go back to that previous image. They're now all trees all scaled, all transformed the way I want to transform them. And you can change that to all kinds of different things. And even jumping back to the cloud brushes, I can have five cloud brushes within the one brush that we're making. So again, there's gonna be a lot more tutorials <laughs> for this program, because this program goes deep and there's a ton of stuff you can do with it. Um, but this should blow your mind a little bit. Uh, fame, how are we doing time-wise? 
We're doing great. Um, I think it's a great uh, segue for us to ask questions. So with that, um, Joanna will unmute herself and she'll ask you a few questions. Okay. Okay, um, we have a few, obviously we can't address all of them and there are some quick ones and some longer ones. So I'll just start, if that's okay with you, Brian. Yeah. Okay, so um, quick question. When working on a new project, what canvas size and settings do you use? Uh, I use 11 by 17, uh, 600 DPI. Okay, Generally, so is that the, the standard? It's, yeah, I mean, most people in the comic industry, it's either, it's usually minimum 11 by 17, uh, 400 DPI, uh, and some companies prefer 800 DPI. I believe DC prefers 800 DPI, but 400 DPI works fine. Uh, Tom McFarlane has doing, been doing Spawn for decades, and almost every Spawn issue is 300 DPI, 11 by 17, but I pushed him to go 400 now. Okay. The reason and the reason um, for that, guys, just so you know why you would want to do it and why if you have the the processing power to do the 800 DPI, that gives you more options with that 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 liner. Let's say you do a do a page and someone goes, oh, that's awesome. Let's make a poster out of it. Okay. At 800 DPI, you could do that. At 400 or 300, you start stretching it a little bit. Okay. Um, next, we have two recap questions, very quick. Uh, one is. Could you please show again where to get the lasso fill tool? <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? Uh, that was one that, that took me a while to find that one myself. Uh, so you'll notice it changes the front here. So under the sub tool here, so if you see, usually you'll have the rulers here. So in the same sub tool palette with the rulers, there's frame, saturation, stream, there's direct. That's where you have your line, your curve, curve tool, your polyline, and it's lasso fill is what you want. Okay, uh, next recap question once more. Uh, um, would you please show again whether, how to switch from the white paper to tra transparent? Okay, uh, let's get something that, that, that has something like that. Hang on a second. File open, let me grab one of my grayscales. There we go. That's a good looking pirate sci-fi group, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, so the easy the easy way to deal with this is you just go edit right here, convert brightness to opacity, and when you do it, you'll you'll see, boom, you'll start seeing the checkerboards beneath it. Okay. Okay. Um, then we have a question that was asked by different people. It's the same one. Do you have any advice on converting from traditional inking to digital inking? Um, yeah, I, I would think uh, one of the first things I would say is is think a little bit outside the box. Like I was just showing how to lay flats with the lasso tool. Think about what you can do digitally that will still get you the look that you want to have, but you can do it faster and more efficiently. So the ability to use the beautiful opacity, op opaque white, you know, the ability to transform things, the ability to like even here they have, you know, a whole bunch of different uh, transform tools that you can even use. Like this is a mesh tool, so I can start warping my my inks as well. So you have to think a little bit outside the box. But the other thing I would say too is is just make sure you, you ink not super zoomed in. A lot of people when they first start transitioning from 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 uh, conventional inks, analog inks to digital inks, they start working way too close. Don't work that close because that will just waste your time. Yeah. And in connection to that, it's like, how do you make sure that when inking, the final result doesn't look static? <laughs> um, part of that is, is, is really, I hate to say experience uh, in the, the day, but what I would also uh, uh, tell people to is this, you know, our monitors are so pretty these days and they're, they're so well lit and, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff is sometimes what you can really tell on your inks or, uh, to make them better is print them out. Print it out on a page and put them up. I have uh, on my wall right now the next issue I'm working on and I always will print it out because as I walk by, I'll notice something I missed or, or something like that, you know. Um, but uh, also the key to, uh, I think, making... Uh, inks not look too static is to have a nice bounce to the work, nice thick, thin to the line art, and all that stuff. 
Okay. Um, so, um, many artists today use micron pens for inking. What tool would you consider the equivalent of that on Clip, in Clip Studio Paint? Yeah, I, I would think that that that, that uh, G Pen works pretty well. Uh, if you do a little Google search, I downloaded. Uh, I think this is one of those older pens. It's called a Cell Pen, which has a nice bounce to it as well. Because um, if you want, and and, and you know, it's really about how you press with that with that stuff, you know. Hmm. So, um, and another one's like, do you treat digital inking as a separate thing from traditional inking, or do you look for cross in terms of techniques? Um, I when I do digital inks, and when I do most of my digital work in general, I try and think about how we can do things that you can't do traditionally. So the idea is to take something that is um, is already uh, exists. Like these are these are all conventional brushes right here. I can make all these into curved brushes that I can paint with in uh, in, in in Mega Studio. So I I I I I'm a big fan of the hybrid approach. I'm a, I'm a big fan of taking the analog stuff, throwing it in, inking on top of that, you know, and spitting it back out and maybe do some painting on top of that, all that kind of stuff, back and forth. Okay. Um, so the next part, a bit more industry related. So um, do you think that school is more important than really practicing to make it in the business or is social media like on ArtStation or other platforms just as important? <laughs> that's a that's a that's a that's a, a, a interesting question. I think I, I think uh, when I was coming up doing this stuff, um, I was really uh, there weren't a lot of places that you could go to learn comic book stuff. Uh, so I really had to go around find any kind of article and and read on those things. There's a lot of stuff out there right now. I would say. <sighs> That's a tough question. Uh, uh, these days, you really can kind of hunt down. A lot of people who are, are very famous artists and illustrators will have their own webinars or teaching, you know, at some place this weekend or whatever. I would always try and, and, and mark out the people who I want to learn from. It's like, oh, that guy, he does that stuff. I love that stuff. I want to learn how to do that, you know. Um, so that's a value. And then, you know, as your chops get better and better and better, you have to be out there in social. So yeah, ArtStation, uh, you know, uh, I don't think Deviant Art is quite what it used to be for this kind of stuff. But uh, uh, I know uh, editors troll around ArtStation all the time looking for talent. OK, um, we have two more to, um, and then there's another one that's more industry related or um, writing related, which is the most difficult part of producing a graphic novel, the drawing or coming up with an idea? <laughs> the, 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 the drawing takes longer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, if you're doing a graphic novel, uh, it's a marathon. It's a lot of work. So you have to make sure that idea that you start with is something you really want to do. Because <laughs> otherwise, at a certain point, you're going to go, ugh, this is a lot of work, and uh, I don't want to do it anymore. Because um, uh, really, I mean, and, and the ideas can just come from out of nowhere, you know, or, or, or so uh, get, but getting an idea you really want to do and an idea that's really good, yeah, that could be a challenge. Uh, but at the end of the day, doing the artwork is a heavy lifting. For example, I mean, let me just throw this out there. So most professional comic book writers write three to four books a month, um, comic books meaning. Um, uh, there are very few comic book artists that could do three to four books a month art-wise. OK. Um, so uh, last question, which is one we got pretty much at the beginning, uh, and it's related to the photo of your introduction. Um, it appears that you, you are using a Wacom Cintiq 22 HD. Just wondering about how you experience with it and if you've made a change since that initial photo you're working in your work. You know, it's, 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 a, it's great. I'm perfectly happy with it. Um, I, uh, I, at home, I still have my, I think the first, one of the first earlier generations uh, of, uh, of Centiques, and it's great too. Uh, this one's probably better, um, but uh, it, it's, I have the one at home is God. I think I've probably had it for 
10 years and it still runs like a champ but my home studio okay um so from my side that's all the questions i got uh fahim do you have any more no i don't but i wanted to thank you uh joanna for your uh, questions and for the audience for their questions i think we're getting to that time where um, the webinar is coming to an end. Uh, before we leave, uh, Brian, did you have any comments or anything that you wanted to share before we say goodbye to everybody? Yeah, I would just, you know, we're, we're ramping up my tutorials. You're going to find a whole bunch more of them on them. So, you know, I would say, you know, hit up our Experience Anomaly, hit up our digital art tutorials. We're Twitter at Anomaly World there on Facebook. Uh, we have uh, digitalartutorials.com, and I keep posting little little things. Like all of a sudden, I think, oh, someone needs to know how to use this tool. So it'll be a little quick two, three minute tutorial, boom, and stuff. So it's worth checking out, I think. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you for taking the time to do this webinar. Um, and as per Brian, um, you can access his stuff on experienceanomaly.com forward slash anomaly, as well as at digitalarttutorials.com. So please make sure to check him out. Uh, and uh, as well, if you wanted to learn a little bit more about Clip Studio Paint um, or anything like that, please check out graphicsly.com and clipstudio.net forward slash en. And with that, thank you so much for everyone that participated and that attended this webinar. We really appreciate your time. We look forward to doing more webinars with you. And with that, have a great day. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. Bye -bye. Thank you.